Hello everybody, my name is Lubomira Dimitrova from Bulgaria Development Agency and I'm going to speak to you about business development and fundraising. With me you're going to have four lectures on different topics in this area which is part of module 7 of the COMPASS project. Before we go into our today's lecture I would like to speak a little bit more about how our lectures are going to be structured. As you can see, we are going to have four lectures on different topics, each and every one of them is going to last for 30 minutes. Your final task is going to be to develop your own business plan. I'm going to speak about this in details once we go into lecture 2, business planning and strategy, but you should have in mind that this is a task which you can do both alone or in group. Once you finish your task, you're going to send it to me for final evaluation. But don't be scared, this is nothing to be afraid of. This is just one point in which I can encourage you to go deeper in uh, the differences and the specifics of running your own company. Before we start, I'm going to make a little notes about the readings which you have to do. As you can see, in the lectures you're going to have two types of readings one obligatory and one optional. Usually the obligatory ones are directly related to the lecture which we had and uh, it's going to be um, obligatory for you because it's going to give you a better picture and more information in depth about all this uh, knowledge you need to gain in order to form your company. On the other hand there are the optional readings which uh, are not so related with the material but are important to you in a sense that they will give you a glimpse about opportunities, chances and facts which you may not know regarding the lecture which we had and its relation to the practice and the business. Please have in mind that even though I am giving you about 4 to 5 topics and articles to read per week, this does not mean that you cannot search in the internet. Have in mind that this is an endless space in which you can find all sort of information which you can find interesting. However, if you are confused about something or you're not sure whether the information is relevant, you can always contact me for more information. As you may have questions and I'm sure about that, please have in mind that you should write them down once the lecture is taking place and then you should send it to me on the email which has been shown and I'm going to reach every one of them and answer them in the beginning of the next lecture. I am going to say just one final word before we go into the lecture and this is that in order to be successful in the things which you are doing it is not enough just to listen the lectures you can participate in all the other parts of the course including the forum section in which you can chat even ask me if you want to about different topics which, which you find interesting and they are related to the sustainable site conversion so let us go now to the first lecture of our module the first type of enterprise which I'm going to present is the sole trader. It is the most achievable type of a company. In the majority of cases, this is a single person business and the owner is, is responsible for the aspects of it. You generally make all the decisions about starting and running your business and you can employ people. There are some advantages in opening this type of company. Firstly, it is simple to set up and operate. You retain complete control of your assets and business decisions. There are fewer reporting requirements and any losses incurred by your business activities may be offset against other income, such as your investment income or wages. It is relatively easy to change business structure if your business growth grows or if you wish to wind things up. There are some disadvantages as well. The unlimited liability means that all your personal assets are at risk if things go wrong. Little opportunity for tax planning. You can't split business profits or losses with family members and you are personally liable to pay tax on all the income from your business. There are again some other factors you need to consider which in the majority of cases are relevant to your country. In this regard I would advise you to check your legislative framework before you start your company. 
In terms of your business name, it is often the case that the name of the company has to be your personal name. Before choosing a business name, check its availability as a domain name. Even if you don't plan to set up a website immediately, checking and reserving your domain name can avoid problems in the future. Regarding the tax requirements, the sole trader are taxed as individuals and paid income tax at personal rates. The tax which you need to pay varies in each country. Regarding the insurance, a sole trader is responsible for the liabilities of the business. Liability is unlimited and includes all personal assets, including any assets jointly owned with another person, such as a house or a car. You are not covered by workers' compensation should you injure yourself at work. This may result in a loss of income if you cannot work and you may still be required to pay any expenses for your business such as a loan repayment. Usually, the sole trader is common when the business is small and there is a one person who is in charge of it. Therefore, there is another type of organization which is more suitable in cases when the business starts to grow. This, in this case, we are speaking about the limited liability company. Unlike the case of the sole trader, in the limited liability company, the owner can choose the amount invested in the company and it is not responsible for his private property. Shareholders can claim ownership up to the amount they have invested in the business. General partners, on the other hand, have the unlimited liability. The owners of the limited liability company are responsible up to the limit of the company's capital, which is different from the capital's assets and income. So, in the case that your company potentially goes in debt, you are responsible up to the amount in the capital which you have set in the beginning of uh, the establishment of your company, and not with your own property. If customers partners or third parties file a lawsuit against the company, they are suing the partnership and not the individuals or stockholders. They are not liable for loans and other debts that the company has. Unlike them, investors, owners of general partnerships and solid proprietors are liable for business debt. There are some features of the limited liability company. It dissolved in case of bankruptcy or the death of a partner while corporations can continue their operations if any of this happen. The company is dissolved if a partner leaves. The other members can start a new company or a partnership. There are certain advantages to incorporating a limited liability company. It has less record keeping, including supporting documents, records, books, and reports. Corporations are not required to hold quarterly or board meetings. The owners are not responsible for poor financial, management, and legal decisions made by one partner. In addition, the partners can choose how to distribute the profits. Investors have no or little say in the normal operations of the company unless specified in the operating agreement. The requirements for running a limited liability company are not as strict as that of the corporations, which give businesses more flexibility. Regarding the incorporating of a limited liability company, there are certain specifics as well. In order to register the company, it needs to have a name as well as the addresses and the details of the partners in the company, as well as an open bank account with the sum minimum of the one which has been set up by each and every state. Depending on the jurisdiction, the company may have to file with the Department of Commerce, the Corporation Commission or another agency. 
The third step is to develop an operating agreement which outlines the structure, financial matters, regulations and opportunities. The agreement specifies the responsibilities of the partner, their rights, and the way losses and profits are recorded and allocated. You should have in mind that it is not necessary the case when a partner has participated with 40% of the shares of the company's capital and receives the same amount of dividends. However, it is still the most common and used way. As a next step, the partners should obtain all permits and license required for specific sector. They may vary in the different municipalities and states. Finally, the company should hire employees and workers and announce the start of its operations. The requirements vary and it is best to contact the local filling office for more information. According to proponents, the limited liability company combined the best features and practices established by partnership and company law. Critics know that form may actually confuse principles, making it more difficult to operate as a coherent entity. They also claim that the limited liability company is not suitable for arrangements for small businesses. For investors, limited liability partnerships involve risk at higher costs. The next type of organization about which we are going to speak is the non-governmental organization. The non-governmental organization is a type of organization which works for community benefit and even though it does generate profit, it does not distribute it. There are different types of NGOs according to their structure and orientation. By their orientation, they are divided into charitable organizations, service, participatory and empowering organizations. The charitable orientation often involves a top-down paternalistic effort with little participation by the beneficiaries. It includes NGOs with activities directed toward meeting the needs of the poor people. The service-oriented NGOs include such uh, organizations with activities providing health, family planning or educational services, in which the programmer is designed by the NGO and people are expected to participate in its implementation and in receiving the service. The participatory orientation NGOs are characterized by self-help projects where local people are involved particularly in the implementation of a project by co contributing cash to land, materials, labor, and so on. In the classical community, the development project participation begins with the need definition and continues into the planning and implementation stages. The empowering NGOs aim to, the help, to help people develop a clearer understanding of the social, political and economic factors affecting their lives and to strengthen the awareness of their own potential power to control their lives. There is a maximum involvement of the beneficiaries with NGOs acting as facilitators. By the level of operation, they are divided by community-based organizations, citywide organizations, national, international organizations. The community-based organizations, also known as CBOs, arise out of people's own initiatives. They can be responsible for raising the consciousness of the urban poor, helping them to understand their rights in accessing needed services and providing such services. The citywide organizations include organizations such as chambers of commerce and industry, coalitions of business, ethnic or educational groups and associations of community organizations. The national and international NGOs are divided by their scope of operation and, as you may already imagine, the national operate only on national level and the international organizations operate globally. Apart from NGO, there are many alternatives or overlapping terms in use, including third sector organization, non-profit organization, voluntary organization, civil society organizations, grassroots organization, social movement organization, private voluntary organization, 
self-help organization, and non-state actors. In Spanish, French, Italian, and other Romanese languages, the mirrored abbreviation ONG is in use, which has the same meaning as an NGO. As the NGO is a non-profit organization, it is always dependent on fundraising and donors. In this regard, we will present the basic tools for raising money for a certain project or idea. After you have developed your resource mobilization plan and assigned roles for the tapping resources from various sources, you need to prepare your tools, or in other words, your marketing materials. Obviously, you will not seek funding from donor agencies without a proposal, and you will not organize fundraising events without getting your information brochure ready. So what are the promotional materials required to carry out the resource mobilization process? Well, they are simply divided into organizational profile, brochure, annual report, governing document, fact sheet, and website. Well, regarding the organizational profile, you must make sure you have developed your organizational profile that will have the basic information about the name of your organization, contact address, contact person, objectives, vision, working careers, and so on. You can learn more about this type of uh, organizational profiles by checking the websites of different organizations. The brochure, on the other hand, is a more attractive way of presenting your organizational profile. You can get it printed with an interesting text and graphics. The annual report comes with the complete documentation of one year's activity along with the financial details. The governing document provides an overview of how your organization is structured. As for the fact sheet, it offers a quick and concise information about the organization. You should have in mind that the website is a must. Websites have now become an essential tool for identification. They can play a powerful role while raising funds from international donors. Any donor sitting remotely would like to take a look at your website. So, that was it for our today's session. Please have in mind that before you go and meet again in our lecture 2, you have two different types of readings. The first one of them, as I already said, are the obligatory ones. They are strongly connected with the things which you have already spoken about. The first one of them is what is enterprise and you can find the link in the upper corner. The, the other article is the different forms and types of enterprise in businesses. This, as I already said, to some extent is related to the things which you already spoke about, but firstly it's going to strengthen your knowledge which you have gained today, and secondly it's going to widen your perspectives for different ideas and opportunities if you already are willing to start your own company. The second type of readings, the optional ones, are a little bit more lighter as I can define them and uh, they are basically related in their larger extent to uh, the fundraising topic related to the NGOs. As you have already learned, the NGO does not distribute its own profit. You should have in mind that it is important to find the different channels for fundraising in which you can use the channels which you have already discussed. The first type of article is the different type of social enterprise. You can find this article extremely interesting having in mind that in the majority of cases the area of sustainable development is strongly related to the field of social entrepreneurship. The second article is uh, generally related to the grant fundraising su success and you should have in mind that we are going to speak about grants a little bit more in our last, next sessions but still, it is important to have at least a glimpse on how actually the NGOs are functioning. The third and the last article is the five online fundraising best practices for small NGOs in developing countries. As you may have already known, it is not the case that you come from developing countries, but I chose this article as it is interesting to give you a glimpse on uh, how the NGOs are finding their opportunities for funding and uh, how what cases actually are shown from different countries. You can find this extremely useful if you manage to form your own NGO in the future. The last section of our lecture is dedicated to the sources which I have used for the lecture. 
Please have in mind that you can read this article in originals, they are not that big and you can always rely on them if you need to go further or to extend a bit your knowledge if you have forgotten something or if you have forgotten to write them down. Well, that's it for me and we are going to meet again for our second lecture. I wish you a good day and bye bye. With this information, we are going to end our today's session. I hope that you find the information useful. As I mentioned in the beginning, if you have any questions, please write them down and send it to me so that I can answer your questions in the beginning of next session. Please also note that the information which I have gave you is only a glimpse of all the required information you will need to have before opening a company. You may already notice that there are some useful links with materials for this course and yet, as I mentioned a couple of times, there are many state specifics which you need to know but which I cannot present now. That means that you should be aware and you should check up your legislative framework and be aware of all its specifics in establishing a company. So goodbye for, for me now and see you during our last session.